For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus. Good afternoon and uh, thanks again for joining us uh, today on a Thursday instead of our normal Tuesdays, in part because the governor updated the state on Tuesday with many updates, everything from COVID-19 to wildfires to our power shutoffs. And again, it's a real privilege to be with you. I'm going to focus a lot of my remarks today on an issue we've been talking about over the past couple of weeks with our blueprint uh, to a safer economy, uh, an equity measure that the state continues to work hard with local partners the county level, others, to make sure we choose something that really makes sense for California. But before I go into those details, I wanted again to invite up the state's acting uh, public health officer, Dr. Erica Pond, to walk through uh, the typical COVID-19 number updates, as well as some information on testing and our response as an agency to some of the needs those who are facing evacuations from wildfires across the state are experiencing. So, Dr. Pond. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Secretary Galley. It's wonderful to be here this afternoon. So I will start to give a little bit of an overview of our numbers for today. So as of September 9th, we have 3,338 new cases here in California. Our seven day average is 3,670. There are encouraging trends that are ongoing with this. This is definitely a decreasing number over time. As far as our total tests, our seven day average of tests uh, is 103,724. And I'll be showing you in a few slides forward uh, what those trends are looking like. Our 14 day test positivity is 4.0%. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk today about the air quality and the fires and the um, multiple fires going on throughout the state. And many of us can't even you know, look out the window without being reminded, much less listening to the news of the, the, the ongoing fires across the state. And one thing that's really challenged all of us during this time of wildfires and uh, poor air quality and COVID-19 is thinking about how we can shelter people safely when we have a pandemic. And we are uh, pleased to share with you that we have managed to uh, arrange uh, non-congregate shelters, which essentially are individual uh, rooms uh, in hotels, so that we can safely shelter people who have had to evacuate from their homes and not put them at increased risk for COVID-19. So of all the individuals who are sheltered, 5,231 of them are in non-congregate shelters and only 81 are in congregate shelters. And again, this is really um, a way we are able to get people safely um, in, in a couple different ways and not put them at risk for COVID-19. And we also just wanna take this opportunity to remind people that this is not a time to let our guard down. We are of course in the midst of many difficult situations here in the state. Um, and again, with the poor air quality, but this is not a reason to gather indoors. And I know we've had a lot of guidance about doing things outdoors when we do have good air quality. And, and now we have this unfortunate situation where we need to be indoors because of air quality in many parts of our state. But we do encourage you to remain indoors and with your household members, but this is not a reason to gather indoors. I also want to turn now to talk about testing here in California. So this is absolutely critical to our continued response to COVID-19. And we as a state are really uh, seeing testing as a priority. We want it to be accessible. It needs to be timely and we want to see equitable testing. And we are really pleased to share that our test turnaround times uh, have been improving and they need to be within 24 to 48 hours to allow for effective isolation and quarantine because those tests have to be taken then they need to be reported to the individual reported to the local public health department and really in order to interrupt transmission and get people safely isolated and quarantined to interrupt that transmission it needs to happen in a timely way so laboratories across the state have been reporting results and we are very pleased again to say that now 66% uh, of the results we are seeing are reported within one day 
and 88% of our results are being reported within two days. So that overall turnaround time average across the state is 1.3 days. So this is huge progress. Many of you remember we were seeing long delays several weeks ago, and again, we've made a great deal of progress with this. We've also launched our testing turnaround time dashboard, which is now available at testing.covid19.ca.gov, which will be updated weekly. Wanted to just show you a, a flash of what that looks like. So I already covered most of the information at the top of this slide. And again, you can see we've seen improvements of 13% on our turnaround time within one day. And uh, again, almost 90% of our turnaround times are within that two-day window that we're looking for. And you can see on the lower graph, a trend again, we um, have seen some decreases over the last few weeks. I think this is a combination of many things. I think certainly the fires and air quality have led to some of this, but I think as we've seen decreasing cases across the state, again, this is encouraging that we are seeing good trends, but I think there's less interest. And it's also a time we're really thinking thoughtfully about um, how we can change now that we have improved turnaround times and we have more testing capacity, especially more in its way, we really need to think more about uh, what we would sometimes call surveillance testing and really thinking about how not just to find cases um, that are symptomatic or cases that are known to be in a high risk setting or situation, but really thinking about how do we prevent cases and outbreaks and how do we continue to find cases, especially with this challenging disease where people often have uh, infection and don't have symptoms and where do we look for them and look for them strategically and use our testing statewide to do that. So we're working on some frameworks around that to really update our prioritization scheme. Our last update of that several weeks ago and we're re-looking at that and we'll be issuing an updated prioritization soon given again our improved turnaround times and in improving trend rates on, uh, on cases. But we wanna make sure again, we're not letting our guard down and we wanna to continue to find cases and prevent and interrupt transmission here in the state of California. So with that, I will turn things back over to Secretary Galley. Thank you, Dr. Pond. Um, I'll just reiterate uh, just how proud I am of the testing task force and, and our leaders of that task force and all the staff that work with labs across the state, collection sites across the state to ensure that we have access and that these turnaround times um, have seen the improvement they can. And in fact, this new dashboard that the team has put out, I think is really a nation leading da uh, dashboard, not just highlighting turnaround times and the number of tests, but even getting to the level of looking at different labs and how their performance is so that we can really work with some labs to improve where that's needed and praise those labs that are really helping contribute to this improved performance. So really grateful for uh, you know the governor's guidance and putting the task force together and empowering them to do good things like the work that you're seeing here today. So as I mentioned at the top, wanted to spend some time talking about our new blueprint, which you know we've we've now announced two sort of rounds of reporting periods, these revised criteria that allow us to loosen and tighten restrictions on activities based on um, a couple of simple metrics that we've used for a long time. These are the taste test positivity rates, the adjusted case rates, and what is a forthcoming equity metric. And our goal all along has been to create a California where we all have equal opportunities for optimal physical health, mental health, and well being. This is that combination of not just our concern about how people are faring with COVID, whether they, they um, are infected, and what their sort of uh, response is, whether they're hospitalized and their treatment course, but also considering how how COVID and the environment that we're in impact their overall well-being, including their mental and emotional health. We recognize that these have been tough times, many, many months, ever since January and February, uh, the challenges that come with our response to the pandemic, not just the worry of being infected. So coming, all of these things together, looking at those disparate impacts and we know that uh, exposure to COVID-19 has exacerbated many of our underlying health inequities, especially among underserved and marginalized groups, and really have seen the intersecting of factors like race and economic inequalities that cross cut across many of the COVID-19 data points that we share with you. 
on a very regular basis. We know that COVID has had a disproportionate impact on the groups listed here, individuals with underlying health conditions, older Californians, those in the essential workplaces like our agricultural industry or factories and manufacturing plants, uh, restaurants and grocery stores as well. Uh, we've talked about the impact on uh, communities of color and particularly Latinos and Black Californians, persons with disabilities and functional needs, and immigrant populations across the state all have had uh, a disparate impact of COVID-19 and one that the state has in an ongoing way been working hard to commit to reducing some of those disparities that we've seen. As I mentioned, cases and deaths are more common among Latinos across all age cohorts. Frankly, the, the group of Californians most impacted, uh, really 60%, nearly 60% of our cases in California have been among Latinos. Uh, nearly 50% of the deaths among Latinos, yet they make up just shy of 40% of California's population. So you see as a general 60, 50, 40, um, that that impact is not insignificant and something that the state continues to work with partners across our counties to focus on. Deaths are more common among Blacks, particularly among in the lower age groups and in the 65 and plus age group, wherein we see most of the deaths experienced across COVID in older Californians. Uh, among Black Californians, we see a disproportionate share of younger people who are dying. Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders also have higher case rates and deaths. And over the last week or two, noticing increasing cases among um, other Asian populations in the state. So again, uh, a disease that really knows no bounds and really has an affinity uh, and higher infection rates among some of our uh, communities of color across the state. Achieving health equity requires us to prioritize resources. It doesn't happen by accident. Actually, the opposite usually happens if we don't make these prioritizations and resources. And we need to target the those resources to our disproportionately impacted populations, as I've mentioned. Racial equity, which I and a number of colleagues talk about on a regular basis, thinking about racial equity in health, really this concept where um, conditions are achieved where race no longer predicts your outcome with health and that conditions for all groups are improved. And so we work with a, a commitment to racial equity to really reduce those disparities and differences between racial groups' experience with COVID-19. But really, this has been worked on for decades when it comes to diabetes and heart disease, strokes, Alzheimer's, other conditions where we see increased uh, prevalence among different racial groups uh, as a whole. So to give you a closer look, the state is working with our county partners and other leaders with experience in thinking about addressing health disparities to not just look at each county um, with their overall test positivity, but also looking at it at the community level. For example, considering a comparison of test positivity in some of the higher income communities in a county versus the lower income communities and then using those comparisons to work with counties to narrow the gap between those communities. This may require increasing testing in some of the lower income communities above where it is today, and working to bring culturally competent contact tracing and supportive isolation in levels that we don't have today, all in order to close that gap and allow all Californians to um, experience uh, a better chance of not only not getting infected with COVID-19, but having better outcomes if they do. Before I end and uh, turn this over to the many folks with questions, uh, I just want to take a moment to remind you that the simple acts make a big difference. We've talked now for months about wearing a mask and 
I think each week I'm impressed by the new literature in the medical community demonstrating the uh, benefits of wearing a mask. Not only does it help many people not get infected, that when they do, uh, they have very little, if no symptoms at all, and they do a lot better. So wearing that mask, as we've said the last couple of weeks, not only protects others around you, but really does work to protect you as well. Um, maintaining six feet of distance, I received, as I do each week, uh, a number of opinions and articles. And somebody sent me just yesterday this idea that uh, physical distancing uh, has become the stepchild to masks. Everybody's wor wor worried and focusing on making sure we have good mask wearing, yet remaining some six feet apart even more if possible is another great way to prevent transmission. And we talked about it routinely, but I wanted to take a moment to punctuate it today. Of course, washing your hands uh, and minimizing mixing when possible. As Dr. Pond mentioned, you know, with poor air quality and, and frankly, the opportunity when you're being evacuated to maybe seek shelter at a friend's house who you haven't seen in weeks, maybe even months, and having that opportunity to do it safely, wearing your mask, making sure you're staying with your household, making sure you're not sharing the dinner table, sharing utensils. If you can have your own bathroom, that's great too. All of these things are steps to reduce the risk of transmission during a time where we're already facing some real difficulties statewide. I'll remind you that um, the number that Dr. Pond shared of the number of people sheltered, just over 5,000 in uh, hotel rooms across the state, those are the folks that the state and counties and the Red Cross support to find that shelter. But that usually makes up under 5% of the total number of people evacuated. That means 95% are seeking shelter with friends and family in alternate places. And so it becomes a really important point that we continue to keep up our guard, make sure that we're doing the things that we know reduce spread so we can continue on the good gains that we've made over the past many weeks as we enter winter and colder weather potentially, as we enter flu season and we know that we wanna get transmission as low as we can statewide so we don't have to, in the future months, go backwards with other changes to our opening plan that we've been sharing with you over the last many weeks. So before uh, we turn it over to questions, I just wanna um, just really uh, emphasize our uh, concern and consideration for just the number of things going on across our state, that it takes its toll on many of you, just like it does many of us at the state, and that we're in this together, that we, as we did early on in the COVID response, 40 million strong come together, we will continue to do that with whatever comes our way in California. And I'm proud and humbled to be there with you, um, supporting all along the way. So with that, we'll take the first question. Sophia Bolog, Sacramento Bee. Hi, Dr. Galley. Thanks for taking our question. Um, I'm hoping you can speak a little bit about uh, the effects you're seeing of the state's new uh, uh, basically reopening protocols. So first of all, can you talk a bit about what the administration was hoping to achieve by choosing the colors that you did for the new system? And are you know counties and, and regular people interpreting them the way that you had hoped? And can you point us to any examples uh, that you've seen that the new system is working better than what you were doing before? So to answer the last part of your question first, um, you know, we're, we're looking for those trends now and it is a bit early. We're really seeing the first set of counties just have just over 10 days of changes to their own uh, conditions. We saw a number of larger counties this week, really Orange, uh, San Diego, these counties that have moved to uh, allow some additional operations of those business sectors. So we're keeping our eye on those trends and to see uh, what, what clues that we uh, pick up in the data, in the um, conversations with our county partners about how this is working. I think overall our goal, as we said before, was four tiers, much uh, more simple, 
straightforward to track rather than 58 different approaches county by county across the state. Um, an understanding of what it takes to meet each tier's thresholds, a sense of how long a county will remain in a tier before they can move to the next one. All of those um, concepts are be, being more normalized across our county leaders with business leaders. So I think increasing understanding of how the system works. Um, what we really tried to achieve was to make sure that we went slow and um, stringent, that we had rigorous rules around what allows you to move when and where, and that we were going to be patient. And of course, there's a number of Californians asking us to go a little faster. Others who say, you know, are you sure this isn't too fast? So we're working through all of those conversations, taking that feedback, but so far really sticking to the system that we've seen. And um, as I'm sure all of you hope, I hope too, that we're going to see the fruits of that as we enter the fall months that we continue to see transmission rates drop, that the ability to identify cases with our testing turnaround time improvements, and then to trigger all of the work around contact tracing really helps us keep transmission down as we're seeing the trends continue across the state. Patrick Healy, NBA, NBC, Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Doctor, I, uh, hopefully you can comment on a couple of things for us today. Number one, the new UCLA study that looked at uh, reports of, of coughing that became very elevated in December and continued elevating, the conclusion being that that means COVID was spreading in the community here, or at least had come back from overseas, uh, perhaps sooner than we realized. Is that consistent with your understanding of the timing? And the second question would be, uh, Los Angeles City and County yesterday uh, encouraged its citizens to download a contact tracing app called Citizen Safe Pass. Are you familiar with that? And will the state be recommending residents in the entire state go ahead and download that app? Thank you. Yeah, great, great questions. Thank you uh, for both of them. Uh, we have all along been looking at when we might have seen the first signs of COVID in California. I'll remind you that California had the privilege of helping uh, thousands of uh, Americans come back from overseas, whether it was by ship or by plane. Uh, we did the uh, repatriation efforts out of Wuhan. We did many other efforts to bring Americans home. So our consciousness has been around COVID for quite some time. We knew early on that there were some early um, deaths where autopsies showed uh, potential COVID infections in the month of January. So I can't speak to whether we uh, are convinced yet today that it was milling around California in December, um, but we're open to that and, and um, uh, hope that our response was as timely as we think and believe that as uh, increased transmission started that California was there with early uh, stay-at-home orders compared to the rest of the nation that really allowed us to address the situation locally in a very aggressive and thoughtful way. Um, as for the Citizen app, we've uh, at the state been talking to many developers of apps that help uh, exposure notification and support some of the contact tracing efforts. I will lead by saying that any of these apps are meant to be augmentation tools. They are not meant to replace contact tracing tools, that there's um, been a great deal of investigation, both at the county level and the state level. Citizen, I know, is an app that is already widely used in, uh, in Los Angeles. That's my home county, so uh, I know friends and others who, who have downloaded the app even before its utility around COVID think it's exciting to consider the benefit of this augmented technology to help us curtail the spread of COVID. Uh, but I think there's still questions that remain on how um, accurate it will be at identifying close contacts and whether it can get the hand, information in a timely way and an accurate way in the hands of people to use it. So I'm excited to see this uh, trend in California, frankly, across the nation, across the globe, to understand if these technologies will in fact benefit us 
And we'll see. And I think the state stands ready to take any really beneficial technology and tool and spread it across the state when we have the information that, in fact, it really does support what we're trying to do with our entire pandemic response. Don Thompson, the Associated Press. Good afternoon. Uh, a couple of uh, child-related questions for you today. Uh, Los Angeles County is recommending against door-to-door -door and car-to-car trick-or-treating this year. Wanted to get your view on whether that's warranted or if it's safe if uh, children follow the usual rules about wearing masks, sticking with their own cohorts, social distancing. And does the state expect to update its guidance that currently allows youth sports practices but not games as schools reopen in some fashion and balance safety or attempt to balance safety with socialization? Yeah, great questions. And thank you uh, again. Uh, my kids ask me all the time about the trick-or-treating guidance and, and L.A. County in specific because that's where they live. They wonder the same. Um, you, you know, the first thing I want to commend the county for really coming out and stepping in front of something that is on all of our minds as we move out of summer and into the season of celebrating many things in the fall with the holidays coming up with religious holidays really right around the corner and Halloween, of course, uh, for young kids, uh, really uh, a highlight of the year. I think there's no doubt that we're going to have a very different holiday season and preparing our communities, being thoughtful about the recommendations, being cognizant of the level of transmission are all things that we need to have in place. And the state is beginning conversations with our long, uh, or continuing conversations, I should say, with local partners to develop thoughtful and consistent guidance. I would just say on Halloween, certainly the way we've trick-or-treated in the past is not going to be the way that it's done this year. It may, in fact, be the safest thing not to do it the way we've done in the past or at all. And I think we're working hard to come up with good, clear, and consistent guidance while recognizing the important role that Halloween and other events really play, not just in our memories and creating uh, you know, memories for our children, but really the psyche of our entire community. And, and uh, I, I appreciate the question because it's something that has been squarely um, uh, uh, on our mind. Angela Hart, Kaiser Health News. <clears throat> Thank you, Secretary Daly. Um, I, I actually had a question for the exact same question I wanted to put forward to you, um, as well as Dr. Khan. Um, uh, I just wonder, uh, given the fact that yet another health officer has left um, uh, as recently as yesterday, um, I just wanted to ask both of you if you feel that um, Dr. Daly, from the state perspective, the state has done enough to support local health officers, both in terms of resources as well as uh, clear guidelines. Um, and then I wanted to ask Dr. Pan to answer the same question, um, given your experience in Alameda County as one of the local health officers now um, during, uh, you know, the, the response at the state level. Sure. I'll, I'll have Dr. Pan come up in just a moment. Uh, but the first thing to say is uh, you cannot see the news of yet another and actually uh, a few health officers in the state leaving their positions. And I think it just underscores the how hard these jobs are in this moment, uh, where so much of the county's decisions are really resting on their shoulders, that there's complexities, that it is uh, uh, really following the science and sticking to what we believe are strong public health principles and public health messages is hard to do and and we understand the tensions we experience them in our own households i'm sure dr pond will talk about a bit of her experience in alameda and the state is continued to be committed we hear the um outpouring from communities to uh do more and we consider that all the time and there's a lot of work being done to make sure that we line up our own communications and work to keep people informed so that hard decisions don't become harder because of communication difficulties or, or other things where we aren't in sync and aligned. Uh, there is no doubt that at the state level, what we balance here from a public health perspective is really the collection of the needs across 58 counties. And that's different than what's happening uh, in some of our local areas. So we have worked hard to make sure that that balance is both uh, elegant and respectful, 
uh, and have improved over time, making sure that our communication is tighter. So we look forward to continuing to do more to support counties, to support their own health officers, and, and plead with everybody who's tuning in or, 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 or thinks about this issue um, to, to really work to support their health officers, to follow their advice as it's put out, and, and to enter into dialogue that's constructive around things that you hope to see changed and ask the questions of why this or why that. And I think that healthy dialogue not only supports the role and the expertise that they bring, but allows them to do their job in the best way that they can across the state. So with that, I'll have Dr. Pond come up and share a few ideas as well. Um, thank you very much for the question. I really appreciate the opportunity to respond to that. I, um, as you noted in your question, uh, certainly take this uh, very personally. Uh, based on my local experience, as well as being here as the acting state health officer. And I think, you know, we are absolutely committed uh, here at the state health department and uh, as the acting state health officer, we actually talk to our local health officers uh, at a minimum once or twice a week, often more than that, and also uh, have each other on speed dial. And I do think we have done um, our utmost to support our local public health officers. I think I want to just acknowledge that it is an extremely tough job and um, health officers have been put in positions right now that are, um, you know, not anything that any public health official probably ever anticipated <laughs> to be in the midst of, you know, a once in a lifetime, once in a century pandemic of this magnitude. And we're learning more every day about this disease and the impact on people, the disproportionate impact we're seeing and the magnitude that we talked about and focused on today um, and trying to balance that and trying to balance the science and uh, the policies, trying to protect people from this disease, but also looking at the impact on our economy and how we all absolutely in public health are committed to the social determinants of health. And we know how important the economy is as well to our overall health and well-being. So we continue to look at that science. We try to weigh it and we try to convey it and make the best decisions we can with all the input we can. And we're certainly in a moment where we're you know, not pleasing everybody. And I think local health officers are really receiving the brunt of that. So I would also just echo uh, what Secretary Galley mentioned to really, I ask all of you in the community to do what you can as well, um, to support your public health departments, your public health officials. And I think more importantly, or as importantly, I think we need to come together as a community. We really have seen so much divisiveness and with all of these different, we have so many different tragedies going on right now. We have this pandemic, we have our fires and subsequent poor air quality, um, we have structural racism, and it's really a time to try to come together as a community. And I really do um, sort of ask all of you in the community, and again, appreciate the question, because I think that is really the message that will help our local health officers and will help all of us protect each other and keep each other safe. Thank you. David Rosenfeld, LA Daily News. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking my uh, question. Uh, I'm in LA County, and I was wondering, in regards to the health disparities that you're talking about, sort of augmenting the metrics a little bit, I wonder if you think that would uh, has a chance to delay uh, reopening in LA County? And uh, just because, you know, we have so many, this big population and a lot of minorities, and we have uh, quite a bit of health disparities here. And also related to that, if there is a chance, do you think that uh, at some point uh, parts of LA County, since it is so big, could reopen faster than others, or is it important to to keep that as a uniform policy? Thanks. Yeah, uh, to your second question first. Um, first, thank you for them. And and lots of people are asking about LA in specific, 10 million people big. Uh, we have the county construct across the state, and and we have. Uh, entertained a lot of questions about dividing counties up into different sectors and so far have really determined that the best thing for us to continue to do is to treat a county as a whole. So at the moment, uh, LA County will be LA County, just like its neighboring counties themselves will remain whole counties. In terms of your question around whether our application of an equity metric will delay or slow LA from moving, um, I, as a resident and, and knowing the public health leadership there, 
believe that it won't, that the, the county will continue prioritizing some of the work that the state is calling on all counties to continue to prioritize. And they will continue to make the gains that they have seen already through targeted testing and supportive isolation and really making sure that they're focused on disproportionately impacted parts of the county. So uh, we also anticipate really working closely with counties to make sure that achieving the equity metric is in reach, that it allows us as a state to continue moving forward and really demonstrate that a statewide focus on a very concrete equity issue, health equity issue, is not only um, achievable, but that we can do it while also bringing a, along um, better outcomes for our entire community uh, at large. So our belief and our hope is we're setting it up in a way that not just LA County, but all counties can meet it and be better off because of it. Will Cashel, Mother Jones Magazine. Hi, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, first of all, is there concern that the wildfires could stymie the state's ability to monitor the spread of the pandemic in certain geographies um, if testing sites are closed uh, due to the wildfires? And then additionally, I was wondering if testing would be made available at wildfire evacuation sites, and what happens if someone at a congregate shelter uh, has a fever? Um, where would you send them then? Yeah, great questions. Um, so we we have uh, long been concerned even before wildfire season started, and this one is a little earlier than people anticipated, wondered how evacuations and impacts on testing sites might actually uh, impact our ability to control the pandemic and transmission and spread. And we uh, believe, of course, that uh, certainly the level of disruption and mixing that happens with evacuations and the response could indeed uh, impact transmission. We emphasize and hope that some of the same rules or ideas of wearing your mask and staying six feet apart and not mixing when, when you can avoid it are going to be the same tools that allow us to get through these hard events um, without having surges in cases. Uh, as far as uh, it goes with testing and making testing available at some of especially congregate uh, shelters, uh, when appropriate, we will, would make it available, meaning if we're seeing a cluster of people with symptoms or any concern for increased infections, either we'll bring the testing to the shelter or really advocate and work to get people tested in another way. And we say, as we always do through screening processes at the shelters, that if anyone's experiencing symptoms or having um, any other concerns that they've been exposed to COVID, that there's ways to facilitate testing to get that information in a timely way so the right actions can follow. So all of that is uh, in place. And as shelters pop up and close down, we move that information around with where the need uh, moves to as well. Spencer Castillo, Voice of OC. Hi, Dr. Gally, thanks for taking our question. Um, mine's kind of specific to Orange County, but kind of overall also, and back in the Memorial Day reopening when restaurants and bars and things like that opened up, um, you know, the county shortly after saw a big spike in cases. And I know, you know, counties are aiming to be on certain uh, tiers of this, this new list, the new guidelines for, you know, three weeks at least before moving to another one. My question is, if um, health officials notice a spike, you know, with this quick testing turnaround now, and they're able to quickly contact Trace, say, hey, you know, I've, I've seen a large spike in like movie theater transmission or restaurants. Um, instead of moving back down to like say tier purple, we're in tier red right now, would state health officials step in and, you know, recommend or close down restaurants or movie theaters or gyms, wherever, the uh, major outbreaks are occurring? Yeah, I, really excellent question. Thank you. A lot of focus has been on how you move forward and not so much conversation about what might require be required or seen before somebody, uh, a county moves to a more restrictive tier. Uh, so the idea would be that this state through CDPH and Dr. Pond's leadership would really engage with our local partners to understand what is driving transmission. We hope that cases ha that have come down as we see them increase that the county's ability to do 
contact tracing on more immediately identified cases because turnaround time is there will help cut down the potential for really unmitigated, uncontrolled uh, transmission and surges. So the whole idea and theory of the case is that you use those tools to really prevent large spikes, not just address them. And as counties do that, we hope, especially in large counties, being able to pinpoint where those activities and potential spread is happening, that they can blunt the, the impact and not see the data point to the need to return to a higher or more restrictive tier. That said, we're committed to having conversations with our local partners to understand the different nuance, the different local conditions that might have driven a county to see an uptick and understand how that's been managed because our entire commitment is not just slow and stringent moving forward, but really thoughtful in reapplying any more restrictive conditions so our population, uh, our uh, business owners can continue to rely on moving slowly but forward rather than moving forward and then back again down the road. Final question, Leanne Melendez, ABC7, San Francisco. Thank you, uh, Dr. Galley. Um, the Bay Area, specific to the Bay Area, has shown counties uh, have seen progress um, and could move to the next level. Um, with regard to Alameda County, Marin County, which are very close to moving to red, San Francisco is already red. Um, and you have said that schools can reopen for in-person instruction after two weeks out of the purple tier. What is the likelihood of counties such as Alameda, Marin County, San Francisco, in the Bay Area, what is the likelihood that school districts will allow schools to reopen? So excellent question. And just to reiterate, yes, indeed, what we've said is once in the red tier for two weeks or longer, the ability to make the decision at the local level between public health and school districts to bring in-person instruction back is available. And counties uh, across the state are taking advantage of that and making plans around that at variable degrees. I think these are complicated conversations. What we've said as a guiding principle is we want to make sure students, staff, teachers, and the entire school community not only is safe, but feel safe when returning. So I think there's a number of complexities that every school district is working through, not just uh, you know what is the right time, but do they have the resources and connections around testing or other support uh, supports to make sure that if there are cases or concerns that they can address them right away. I am not personally sure what the exact stances of the conversations in San Francisco, Marin, Alameda uh, are exactly, but I'm sure that officials there are deeply thinking through what the right timing is once that uh, permission through the red tier is, is, is allowed. I think one of the reasons the state put together uh, an intentional testing strategy to bring quite a bit more volume of testing to the state was to give schools another tool to feel confident in their reopening plans, not to hasten it in any way or slow it down, but just to provide another tool. So when those principles are coming together to make these decisions, they have all they can to make the best decision they can. The state prioritizes getting students back to in-person uh, education, but really only when our communities and all of those involved believe that the timing's right and that lower risk environments are indeed uh, uh, able to be created. So with that, I just want to thank you all again. Thank you for your hard work uh, with us. Uh, again, reiterating the really uh, elegant uh, answer that Dr. Pond gave that uh, we're, we really all, this is a time to come together. California has rarely seen the confluence of conditions that we're seeing today. And it's a really a moment not to be divisive, but to come together and move forward together in all of the support that we can give you and that you can give us so that we see ourselves on the other end of this, a stronger and better state. Uh, have a great afternoon. For the latest information regarding the COVID-19 pandemic in Cupertino, please visit cupertino.org slash coronavirus.